Hi, I'm Andy, and in this video we'll be exploring how to attack, detect, and defend against the abuse of Outlook message rules, which, yes, is still a significant threat unless properly controlled. Outlook is the go-to email and calendaring client for many businesses. A key feature to help with automating common tasks is the message rules system, which allows actions to be performed in response to certain triggers. Usually this involves examining a message when it's received and then moving it to a subfolder or assigning it a category if it's from an important contact. Whilst this particular technique is referred to as Outlook message rules, it's worth noting that only some rules are executed via the Outlook desktop client app itself, such as showing a pop-up message, whereas others actually run on the Exchange server, for example, moving a message to another folder. But, regardless of where the rule is evaluated and run, all rules are stored as part of a user's mailbox configuration on the server. A variety of conditions and actions are available, including several which can be taken advantage of by attackers or simply ill-informed users to not only leak sensitive data, but also run code to act as a method of persistence even on modern versions of Outlook. There are multiple ways for an attacker to inject a malicious rule into a user's mailbox. The simplest is via the Outlook desktop app, which requires no special permissions or admin privileges, just access to that user's device. For server-side only rules, the web interface can be used if the user's credentials have been obtained, thus requiring no access to their device at all. Or, as we'll see a bit later, several bespoke tools exist to communicate directly with the server over the MAPI protocol and allow for some particularly crafty tricks. Starting simple, the most common attack involving message rules is to trigger off a message being received, and applying an action to forward that email to an address under the control of an attacker. This might expose sensitive information that the attacker desires, but it's more commonly used to enable an attacker to monitor existing conversations between contacts who trust each other, with the aim of injecting a malicious response at a key time, such as when they're exchanging invoices or payment details. Many businesses have lost a lot of money through payments being redirected to an attacker's bank account through such means. But it's not just attackers who might use auto-forwarding rules. A resourceful user may intentionally configure a similar rule on their own account in order to forward emails to their own personal address as an innocent but misguided way of being able to get their work done from another device. The use of third-party email accounts and services opens up a whole new world of data theft possibilities due to security misconfiguration and lack of robust prevention and detection controls which would commonly be seen on an enterprise system. It's also worth noting that many other email services have message auto-forwarding options which could similarly be abused to leak data. Long-time IT admins will remember that older versions of Outlook included a few extra potential actions to pick from which allowed for scripts and applications to be run. Unsurprisingly, these were abused by attackers, so Microsoft pushed an update to remove them. However, they can easily be re-enabled with a single addition to the registry under HK Current User, Software, Microsoft, Office, then the version of Office, then under Outlook and Security, setting a D word of Enable Unsafe Client Mail Rules to 1. Note that this change is made under HK Current User, so requires no special administrative rights to set. An attacker who has obtained user-level access to a target's machine can set this key, restart Outlook, and then have the option to create a rule which will cause an application to run in response to an email with certain criteria. In this example, any email with hacker trigger anywhere in the subject line will run the Windows calculator, but this could just as easily be any other code, such as a reverse shell back to an attacker, thus providing a method of persistence to allow an attacker back into their victim's machine by simply sending an email. But what if an attacker doesn't yet have access to their victim's device, but does have access to their credentials? We already mentioned the Outlook web app, but this only provides a means to set rules where the actions run on the server side. 
So, several tools have been created to work around this limitation. Creating or modifying rules on the server message store, which will then get pushed to any desktop app that subsequently connects. Ruler, created by SensePost, is one such tool, which automates the steps we saw previously around triggering an executable if an email contains a specific keyword. It can even pull the payload over WebDAV, providing a means of initial execution on a device where that Enable Unsafe Client Mail Rules Registry key has previously been set. Unfortunately, I can't demo it here as during my testing I couldn't get it to play nicely with Exchange 365, maybe down to an improved server-side security config, but do let me know in the comments if you have a better idea of what's happening here. Another Mappy tool, the excellent MFC Mappy by Stephen Griffin, allows for very low level access to a user's mailbox and provides the ability to modify data properties in unexpected ways. Note the rule here currently defines to forward emails to an attacker. However, after firing up MFC Mappy, logging in, opening the data store, and then drilling down into the inbox associated contents, we can pick out entries for each rule. The rules provider property for a rule defines which piece of code and user interface should be used to view and modify a given rule. It's usually set to rules organizer or rules organizer 2 for rules defined by the desktop app, depending on if the rule executes on the server side or client side respectively, or Exchange mailbox rules if the rule were defined by the modern web app. Changing this property to an invalid or blank value leaves Outlook unaware of how to view or modify this rule, with the end result that it is no longer displayed in the user interface on either the desktop app or the web app. For client executed rules, this also breaks the rule from triggering, but server executed rules do still remain active as we can see by further messages to this inbox continuing to be forwarded to the attacker account, even though there is no trace of this rule in the user interface. Rules which have not been explicitly hidden can be identified on a per mailbox basis through the normal desktop or web applications. Hidden rules are trickier to spot, but the web app provides a link to create a diagnostic report so long as at least one non-hidden rule is defined. This report contains all rules, hidden or not, but the format is not particularly friendly. It takes quite some time and effort to pick out the hidden rule here. So an alternative is to use the same MFC Mappy tool as was used during the simulated attack. Any item in the inbox associated contents of type IPM rule version 2 message relates to a rule, and any which have a rule provider that's not rules organizer or exchange mailbox rules, or a valid variant, should be considered suspicious. For system administrators, Microsoft has released a PowerShell tool which can be used to extract the Outlook message rules across an entire exchange instance, allowing for bulk analysis. This extract includes all rules, including those which are hidden, but there's no indication here as to whether they are hidden or not. And with the action and condition fields Base64 encoded, analysis is still somewhat tricky. For cases of automated message forwarding, additional detection methods exist within Exchange 365. Under the Reports section, there's a specific mail flow report which lists all auto-forwarded messages. This provides a means to identify what messages have been auto-forwarded and to where, although there does seem to be quite a bit of a delay between a message being auto-forwarded and it then appearing on this report. Given the huge potential for abuse of message rules, several options exist to prevent the attacks demonstrated earlier. First and foremost, the ability to run code from a message rule can be eliminated by setting the Enable Unsafe Client Mail Rules registry key to zero, although ideally by a logon script, group policy or desired state configuration, thus ensuring that any attempts to re-enable these features quickly get reverted. Once set, if any of those unsafe actions is triggered, 
such as launching an app, an error is shown instead. More robust restrictions can be established on Windows 10 Pro or Enterprise devices via attack surface reduction rules. These can be set via PowerShell, Group Policy, or, as is the case here, via the Endpoint Manager portal. We just need to define a new policy, then specifically configure the Block All Office Applications from Creating Child Processes item to Block, and assign it to all the devices in this tenant. Back on the victim machine, the unsafe rules registry key has again been set to 1. However, now the attack surface reduction policy has been applied, any attempt to trigger the calculator payload is again blocked, this time with an added Defender AV alert. Not only will this neuter the ability for message rules to launch processes, but also goes a long way to protecting against a whole bunch of other Office-based attacks, many of which I'll be covering in future videos. The exfiltration of data via auto-forwarding can be prevented within an Office 365 environment via the outbound spam configuration, which can be found within the Threat Management Policy section, then under Anti-Spam. This option provides the ability to disable auto-forwarding outside of an organisation across all services. In fact, OFF is now the default value for new Office 365 subscriptions. Once this option has been set, auto-forwarding rules can still be defined, and can still run, but forwarded messages get rejected on the outbound gateway and trigger a delivery failure message. In some cases, there may be exceptions where auto-forwarding is necessary, for example, when integrating services with third-party providers. The policy configuration is sufficiently flexible to be able to add exceptions on a per-user or per-group basis. Here, we're allowing only one specific user to be able to auto-forward outside the organisation. A similar posture can alternatively be established via a custom mail flow rule which identifies any messages being sent from within the organisation, destined for outside the organisation, and are of the type auto-forward. Several actions can be applied, from simply dropping the email, to also sending the offending user a notice that they are prohibited from auto-forwarding, to also creating a specific security event for investigation. Further criteria could be set to accept certain users, or raise a higher severity alert if auto-forward attempts originate from high-value target employees such as board members. The end result is that a notification like this one is generated when an auto-forward mail is attempted. These protective measures help reduce the threat of information loss via message rules, and go some way to making business email compromise and the associated financial loss a little more difficult to pull off. However, it can still be possible after just one-off access to a user's mailbox. So, you should still adopt the usual good practice around enforcing multi-factor authentication and running user education programs to make them aware of how to identify common email threats. But that about wraps up this video. If you found it useful, please do give it a like and consider subscribing if you want more of this sort of content. Drop a note in the comments if there's anything you think I've missed around attacking, detecting and defending against Outlook message rules, or if you have a good idea of what topic I should cover next. I'll see you next time.